From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We are in our Palo Alto studios. COVID is still going on, so uh, all of our all of the uh, the interviews continue to be remote. But we're excited to have a, a Cube alumni. He hasn't been on for a long time, but this guy has been in the weeds of the storage industry for a very, very long time, and we're happy to uh, to have him on and get an update because there continues to be a lot of exciting developments. He's Phil Bollinger. Uh, he is the SVP and General Manager, Data Center Business Unit from Western Digital, joining us, I think, from Colorado. So, uh, Phil, great to see you. How's the weather in Colorado today? Hi, Jeff. It's great to be here. Um, well, it's it's a hot, dry summer here, I'm sure, like a lot of places. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, enjoying enjoying the summer through these unusual times. It is it is unusual times, but uh, fortunately, there's great things like the internet and and heavy duty. Uh, compute and store out there so we can we can get together this way. So let's jump into it. You've been in the business a long time. You've been at Western Digital, you were at EMC, you worked on Isilon and you were at, at storage companies before that. And you've seen kind of this never ending up and to the right slope that we see, you know, kind of ad nauseum in terms of the amount of, of storage demands. It's not going anywhere but up and please increase complexity in terms of unstructured data, sources of data, speed of data, you know, all the kind of classic big Vs of, of, of big data. So I wonder before we jump into specifics, if you can kind of share your perspective, because you've been kind of sitting in the catbird seat and Western Digital is a really neat company. You not only have solutions, but you also, you also have media that feeds other people's solutions. So you guys are really, you know, seeing and, and ultimately all this compute's got to put this data somewhere and a whole lot of it's sitting on Western Digital. Yeah, it's uh, it's a great uh, a great intro there. Um, yeah, it's been interesting. You know, through my career, I've seen a lot of advances in storage technology. Uh, you know, speeds and feeds, like we uh, often say, but you know, the advancement through mechanical innovation, electrical innovation, chemistry, physics. You know, just the the relentless growth of data has been has been driven in many ways by the relentless acceleration and innovation of our ability to store that data. And that's that's been a, a very virtuous cycle through you know, what for me has been more than 30 years in, in enterprise storage. There are some really interesting changes going on though. I think um, if you think about it in, in a relatively short amount of time, data has gone from you know, just kind of this artifact of our digital lives um, to the very engine that's driving the global economy. Um, our, our jobs, our relationships, our health, our security, they all kind of depend on data now. And for, for most companies, kind of irrespective of size, um, how you use data, how you, how you store it, how you monetize it, how you use it to make better decisions, to improve products and services, you know, it becomes not just a matter of whether your company is going to thrive or not, but in many industries, it's it's almost an existential question: is is your company going to be around in the future? And it and it depends on how well you're using data. So this this drive to capitalize on the value of data is is pretty significant. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting topic. We've had a, a number of conversations around trying to to get like a book value of data, if you will, and. You know, I think there's a lot of conversations, whether it's accounting kind of way or finance or kind of of goodwill of how do you value this data. But I think we see it intrinsically in a lot of the big companies that are really data based, like the Facebooks and the Amazons and the Netflixes yeah. and the Googles and those yeah. types of companies where it's really easy to see. And if you see, you know, the valuation that they have compared to their book value of assets, right? It's it's really baked into there. So it's 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 fundamental to going forward. And then we have this thing called COVID hit, which you know, you, I'm yeah. sure you see it on the memes yeah. on social media, right? What drove your digital transformation? The CEO, CEO the CMO, the board, or COVID-19? And, and, and it became this light switch moment where your opportunities to think about it are no more. You've got to jump in with both feet. And it's really interesting to your point that it's the ability to store this and think about it now differently as an asset driving business value versus a cost that IT had yes. to accommodate to put this stuff somewhere. So it's a really different kind of a mind shift and really changes the investment equation for companies like Western Digital about how people should invest in higher performance and, and higher capacity and you know, more unified and, and, and kind of democratizing the accessibility of that data to a much greater set of people with tools that can now you know, start making much more business line and inline decisions 
uh, than just the data scientist, mm -hmm. you know, kind of on Mahogany Row. Yeah, and like, as you mentioned, uh, Jeff, here at Western Digital, we have such a unique uh, kind of perch in the industry to see all the dynamics in the OEM space and the hyperscale space and the channel, really across all the, the global economies about this, this growth of data. Um, I've, I have worked at several companies and, and have been familiar with what I would have called big data projects and, and uh, uh, fleets in the past. But at Western Digital, you have to move the decimal point, you know, quite a few digits to the right to get, to get the perspective that, that we have on, on just the, the volume of data that the world is just relentlessly, insatiably consuming. Um, just a, a couple examples for, for our, our drive projects we're working on now, our, our capacity enterprise drive projects. You know, we used to do business case analyses and look at their life cycle capacities and we measured them in exabytes and not anymore. Now we're talking about zettabytes. We're, we're actually measuring um, capacity enterprise drive families in terms of how many zettabytes they're gonna ship in their life cycle. And if we look at just the consumption of this data, the, the last 12 months of, of uh, industry TAM for capacity enterprise compared to the 12 months prior to that, that annual growth rate was north of 60%. And so it's, it's rare to see industries that are, that are growing at that pace. Um, and so the, the, the world is just consuming immense amounts of data. And as you mentioned, the, the COVID dynamics have been uh, both an accelerant in some areas as, as well as headwinds in others, but it's, it's certainly accelerated um, digital transformation. I think a lot of companies were talking about digital transformation and, and um, hybrid models and, and COVID has really accelerated that. And it's, it's certainly uh, driving, you know, continues to drive um, just this relentless need to, to store and access and, and uh, take advantage of data. Yeah. Well, Phil, in, in advance of this interview, I, I, I pulled up the old chart, right? With the, with the, the, all the different bytes, right? Kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes, and zettabytes. And just, just per the Wikipedia page, what is a zettabyte? It's as much information as there are grains of sand in all the world's beaches for one <laughs> zettabyte. And you're talking about thinking in terms of those units. I mean, that is just mind boggling to think that it, that is the scale in which we're, we're operating. It's really hard to get your head wrapped around uh, a zettabyte of storage. And, you know, I think a lot of the industry thinks when we say zettabyte scale era, that it's just a buzzword. Um, but I'm, I'm here to say it's a real thing. We're, we're measuring projects in, in terms of zettabytes now. It's amazing. Well, let's jump into some of the technology. So I've been fortunate enough here at theCUBE to, to, to be there at a couple of major announcements along the way. We talked before we turned the cameras on, the helium announcement and having the hard drive sit in the, in the, the fish bowl um, to get all types of, of, of interesting benefits from this less dense air. Uh, that is helium versus oxygen. I was uh, down at the Mammer and Hammer announcement, which was pretty interesting. Uh, big, big, heavy technology moves there to again increase the capacity mm -hmm. of the hard drive based systems. Um, you guys are doing a lot of stuff on RISC V, I know, as an open source project. So you guys have a lot of things happening, but now there's this new thing, this new thing called zoned storage. So, first of all, before we get into it, why do we need zoned storage? And, and really, what does it now bring to the table in terms of a, a capability? Yeah, it, it, great question, Jeff. Um, so why now, right? I, as I mentioned, you know, storage, I've been in storage for quite some time. Um, in the last, let's just say in the last decade, we've seen the advent of the hyperscale model and certainly the, you know, a, a whole nother explosion level of, of data and, and just the veracity with which the hyperscalers can create and consume and process and, and monetize data. And of course, with that has also come a lot of innovation, frankly, in the compute space around how to process that data, moving from you know, what was just a general purpose CPU model to GPUs and DPUs. And so we've seen a lot of innovation on that side, but you know, frankly, in the storage side, we haven't seen much change at all in terms of how operating systems, applications, uh, file systems, how they actually use the storage or communicate with the storage. And sure, we've seen you know advances in storage capacities. Hard drives have gone from two to four to eight to 10 to 14, 16, and now are leading 18 and 20 terabyte hard drives. And similarly on the SSD side, you know now we're dealing with capacities of seven and 15 and 30 terabytes. So things have gotten larger as you would expect. Um, but, and, and some interfaces have improved. I think NVMe, which we'll talk about, um, has been a nice um, 
advance in the industry. It's really now brought a very modern, scalable, low latency, uh, multi-threaded interface to a NAND flash to take advantage of, of the inherent performance of, of transistor-based persistent storage. Um, but really, when you think about it, it hasn't changed a lot. And so, but what has changed is workloads. One thing that definitely has evolved um, in in the space of the last decade or so is this: the thing that's driving a lot of this explosion of data in the industry is around workloads that I would characterize as as sequential in nature. They're serially captured and written. Um, they also have a very consistent life cycle. So you would write them in a big chunk. You would read them uh, maybe in smaller pieces, but the life cycle of that data, we, we can treat more as a chunk of data, but the problem is applications, operating systems, file systems continue to interface with storage using paradigms that are you know many decades old, the old 512 byte or even 4K uh, sector size constructs were developed in, you know, in the hard drive industry just as convenient paradigms to structure what is a, an unstructured sea of magnetic grains into something structured that can be used to store and, and access data. But the reality is, you know, when we talk about SSDs, structure really matters. And so these, what, what has changed in the industry is the, the workloads are driving very, very fresh looks at how more intelligence can be applied to that application OS storage device interface uh, to drive much greater efficiency. Right. So there's two there's two things going on here that I want to drill down on. On one hand, you yeah. know, you talked about kind of the introduction of NAND and Flash, uh, and treating it like you did um, generically, you did um, a regular hard drive, but 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 you could get away and you could do some things because the the interface wasn't taking full advantage of the speed that was capable in the NAND. But NVMe has changed that. And yes. now forced, um, you know, kind of getting a, uh, getting rid of some of those inefficient processes that you could live with. So it's this kind of classic next next level step up in, in capabilities. One is you got the better media, you just kind of plug it into the old way. Now actually you're starting to put in processes that take full advantage of the speed that that flash has. And I think, you know, obviously prices have come down dramatically since the first introduction. And where before it was yep. always, you know, kind of clustered off or super high end, super low latency, super high value apps, you know, it just continues to, it, to, uh, to spread and proliferate throughout the data center. So, you know, what did NVMe force you to think about in terms of maximizing, you know, kind of the, the, uh, the return on, on the NAND? And flash, yeah, yeah. In NVMe, which you know we've been involved in the standardization effort, I think it's been a very successful effort. But we have to remember NVMe is is about a decade old, you know, or even more when the original work started around defining this this interface. And uh, but it's been very successful. You know, the NVMe standards body is very productive. Uh, you know, cross company uh, effort. Um, it's it's uh, really driven a significant change. And what we see now is the rapid adoption of NVMe uh, in, in all data center architectures, whether it's very large hyperscale to, you know, classic on-prem enterprise uh, to even, you know, smaller applications. It's just a very efficient um, interface mechanism for connecting SSDs into, uh, into a server, you know. Um, so the, we continue to see evolution in NVMe, which is great, and we'll talk about ZNS today is one of those evolutions. We're also very keenly interested in um, NVMe protocol over fabrics. And so one of the things that Western Digital um, has been talking about a lot lately is incorporating NVMe over fabrics as a mechanism for uh, now connecting shared storage into multiple host architectures. We think this is a very attractive way to build shared storage architectures of the future that are scalable, that are composable, uh, that really are more uh, have a lot more agility with respect to rack level infrastructure and applying that infrastructure to applications. Right. Now one thing that might strike some people as kind of counterintuitive is, is within the zone um, storage and zoning off uh, parts of the, of the media to, to think of the um, data also kind of in these big chunks is, is it, it feels contrary to kind of the atomization that we're seeing in, in the rest of the data center, right? So smaller units of compute, smaller units of store, so that you can assemble and disassemble them in, in different quantities as needed. So what was the special attribute um, that you had to, to think about and, and, and actually come back and provide a benefit in actually kind of rechunking, if you will, in these zones versus trying to get as atomic as possible? 
Yeah, the, it's it's a great question, Jeff, and I I think it's maybe not um, intuitive in terms of why zone storage actually creates a more efficient storage paradigm when you're storing stuff essentially in larger blocks of data. But if you this is really where the intersection of structure and and workload and and sort of the nature of the data all come together. Uh, if, if you turn back the clock, maybe four or five years, when SMR hard drives um, host manage SMR hard drives first. Uh, emerged on the scene. Um, this was really taking advantage of the fact that uh, the uh, the write head on a hard disk drive um, is larger than the read head, or can't, or or the read head can be much smaller. And so then the notion of overlapping or shingling uh, the data on the drive, uh, giving the read head a smaller uh, target to read, but the writer a larger write pad to write the data, um, could actually what we found was it in, increases aerial density significantly. Um, and so that was really the emergence of this notion of, of sequentially written larger blocks of data being actually much more efficiently stored when you think about physically how it's being stored. What, what is very new now and, and, and really gaining a lot of traction is, is the, the SSD corollary to SMR and the hard drive. On the SSD side, we have the ZNS specification, which is very similarly where you divide up the namespace of an SSD into fixed size zones, and those zones are written sequentially. But now those zones are are intimately tied to the underlying physical architecture of the NAND itself, the dies, the planes, the the read pages, the the erase pages, um, so that uh, in treating data as a block, you're actually eliminating a lot of the complexity um, and the work that an SSD has to do to emulate. Uh, a legacy hard drive, and and in doing so, you're increasing performance and endurance and um, and uh, the predictable uh, performance of the device. I just love the way that that, that you know you kind of twist the lens on the problem, and and on one hand, you know, by by rule, just looking at my notes here, the zone storage devices, the ZSDs, uh, introduce a number of of restrictions and limitations and, and rules that are yeah. outside the full capabilities of what you might do. But in doing so, the, the, in aggregate, the efficiency and the performance of the system in the whole is much, much better, even though when you first look at it, you think it's more of a limiter, but it's actually opens up. I wonder if there's any kind of performance stats you can share or any kind of uh, empirical data to just to yeah. give people yeah. kind of a feel for what that, what that comes out as. So if you think about the potential of zone storage in general, and when, again, when I talk about zone storage, there's two components. There's an HDD component of zone storage that we that we refer to as SMR, and there's an SSD version of that that we call ZNS. So if you think about SMR, the, the value proposition there is additional capacity. So effectively in, in the same drive architecture with, with you know roughly the same bill of material used to build the drive, we can overlap or shingle uh, the data on the drive and and generate for the customer additional capacity. Today, you know, with our 18, 20 terabyte offerings, that's you know on the order of just over 10%. But that delta is going to increase significantly going forward to 20% or more. And when you think about uh, a hyperscale customer that has not hundreds or thousands of racks, but tens of thousands of racks, um, a 10 or 20% improvement in effective capacity is a tremendous TCO benefit. And, and the reason we do that is obvious. I mean, the, 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 the economic paradigm that drives large at scale data centers is total cost of ownership, both acquisition costs and operating costs. And if you can put more storage in a, in a square you know, tile of data center space, you're going to generally use less power, you're going to run it more efficiently. You're, you're actually, from an acquisition cost, you're getting a more efficient purchase of that capacity and in doing that, our innovation, you know, we benefit from it and our customers benefit from it. So that the, the value proposition for zone storage in, in capacity enterprise HDD is very clear, it's, it's additional capacity. The exciting thing is in the SSD side of things for ZNS, um, it actually opens up a even more value proposition for the customer. Um, because SSDs have had to emulate hard drives, there's been a lot of inefficiency and complexity inside a, an enterprise SSD dealing with things like garbage collection and write amplification, reducing the endurance of the device. You have to over provision, you have to insert as much as 20, 25, even 28% additional NAND bits inside the device just to 
allow for that extra space, the working space to deal with with delete of data that that are smaller than the 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 block erase that that the device supports. And uh, so you have to do a lot of reading and writing of data and cleaning up. Um, it creates for a very complex environment. ZNS by mapping the zone size with the physical structure of the SSD essentially eliminates garbage collection. Um, it reduces over provisioning by as much as uh, 10% or uh, 10x. And so um, if you were over provisioning by 20 or 25% in an enterprise SSD and a ZNS SSD, that can be you know one or two percent. Um, the other thing we have to keep in mind is um, Enterprise SSDs typically incorporate DRAM, and that DRAM is used um, to help manage all those dynamics that I that I just mentioned, but with a very uh, a much simpler structure where um, the pointers to the data uh, can be managed without all that DRAM. Um, we can actually reduce the amount of DRAM in an enterprise SSD by as much as 8x. And if you think about the bill of material of an enterprise SSD, DRAM is number two on the list in terms of the most expensive bomb component. So um, ZNS and SSDs actually have a significant customer uh, total cost of ownership impact. Um, it's it's an exciting it's an exciting standard. And now that we have the standard ratified through the NVMe uh, working group, um, it can really accelerate the development of the the software ecosystem around. Right. So let's shift gears and talk a little bit about less about the tech and more about the customers and and the implementation of this. So. You know, are there, you talked kind of generally, but are there certain certain types of workloads that you're seeing in the marketplace where this is, you know, a better fit or is it just really the big heavy lifts um, where they just need more and this is better? And, and then secondly, within, you know, these both hyperscale companies um, as well as just regular enterprises that are also seeing their data demands grow dramatically. Are you seeing, you know, that this is a solution that they want to bring in for kind of the marginal, you know, kind of next data center, or extension of their data center or their next uh, cloud region, or are they doing, you know, lift and shift and ripping stuff out or, or do they have enough, do they have enough data growth organically that <laughs> there's plenty of new stuff that they can, um, that they can put in these new systems? Yeah, well, the, the large customers don't, don't rip and shift. They they ride their assets for for a long life cycle because uh, with the relentless growth of data uh, you're primarily investing to handle what's what's coming in over the transom um, but we're seeing we're seeing solid adoption in in smr as you know we've been working on that for a number of years we've we've got um you know significant interest in investment co-investment our engineering and our our customers engineering adapting the the application environments uh, to take advantage of of SMR, the the great thing is now that we've got the NVMe, the ZNS uh, standard ratified now in the NVMe working group. Um, we've got a very similar and and all approved now situation where we've got SMR standards that have been approved for some time in the SATA and SCSI standards. Now we've got the same thing in the NVMe standard, and the 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 great thing is once a company goes through the the lift, so to speak. Uh, to adapt an application file system, um, operating system ecosystem to zone storage, it pretty much works seamlessly between HDD and SSD, and so it's not a it's not an incremental investment when you're switching technologies. And for and obviously the early adopters of these technologies are going to be the large companies who design their own infrastructure, who have you know uh, mega fleets uh, of of racks of infrastructure where these efficiencies really, really make a difference in terms of how they can monetize that data, how they compete against, uh, you know, the, the landscape of competitors they have. Um, for, for companies that are totally reliant on kind of off the shelf uh, standard applications, that adoption curve is going to be longer, of course, uh, because there are, there are some software changes that you need to adapt to, uh, to enable zone storage. Um, one of the things Western Digital has, has done and taken the lead on is, creating a, a landing page for the industry with zonestorage.io. It's a web page that's actually an area where, where many companies can contribute open source tools, uh, code, um, validation environments, technical documentation. Um, it's, not a, it's not a marketeering website. It's really a website built to land actual open source content that companies can, can use and leverage and contribute to to accelerate uh, the the engineering work uh, to adapt software stacks to zone storage devices uh, and to share those things. 
Let me just follow up on that, because again, you've been around for a while, and, and get your perspective on the power of open source. And you know, it used to be, you know, the the the, the best secrets, the best IP, were closely guarded and held inside. And now, really, we're we're in an age where it's not necessarily. And you know, the the, the brilliant minds and use cases and and people out there, you know, just by definition, it's a it's a more groups of engineers, more engineers outside your building than inside your building, and how that's really changed, you know, kind of a strategy in terms of development when you can leverage open source. Yeah, op open source um, clearly has has accelerated innovation across the industry in so many ways, um, and it's uh, you know it's the paradigm around which you know companies have built business models and and innovated on top of it. I think it's always important as a company to understand what value add you're bringing uh, and what value add the customers want to pay for. What unmet needs in your customers are you trying to solve for, and what's the best mechanism to do that? And do you want to spend your R and D uh, recreating uh, things or, or leveraging what's available and and innovating on top of it. Um, it's all about ecosystem. I mean, the days where a single company can vertically integrate um, top to bottom a complete end solution, um, you know, those are fewer and far between. I think it's it's about um, uh, collaboration and and building ecosystems and operating within those. Yeah, it's, it's it's such an interesting change. And one more thing, again, to get your perspective, you run the, the data center group, but there's this little thing happening uh, out there that we see growing, you know, IoT um, in, in the yeah. Internet of Things, and in the Industrial Internet of Things, and edge computing as we meet, you know, try to move more compute and store and power, you know, kind of outside the pristine world of the data center and out towards where this data is being collected and processed when you've got latency issues and. And, and, and all kinds of reasons to start to shift the balance of where the compute is or where the store uh, and, and the reliance on the network. So when you look back from a storage perspective in your history in this industry and you start to see that basically everything is now going to be connected, uh, generating yeah. data, and, and, and a lot of it is even open source. I, I talked to a company the other day doing you know, kind of open source uh, computer vision on surveillance, uh, you know, video. Um, yeah. So you know the amount of of stuff coming off of these machines is growing in crazy ways. At the same time, you know, it can't all be processed at the data center. It can't all be, you know, kind of shipped back and then have, uh, you know, have a decision and then ship that information back out to. So when you sit back and look at <laughs> at Edge uh, from your kind of historical perspective, what goes through your mind? What gets you? Excited, you know, what are some of the opportunities that you see that maybe the layman is not paying close enough attention to? Yeah, it's it's really an exciting time uh, in storage. Uh, I I get asked that question from time to time, having been in storage for more than thirty years. You know, what was the most interesting time? And um, and there's been a lot of them, but I, I wouldn't trade today's environment for for any other in terms of just the the velocity with which. Uh, data is is uh, evolving and how it's being used and where it's being used. You know, the a TCO equation may describe what a data center looks like, but data locality will determine where it's located. And we're excited about the edge opportunity. We we see that as a pretty significant, uh, meaningful part of the of the TAM as we look out three to five years. Uh, certainly, five G is is driving much of that. I think just anytime you speed up the the the, the speed of the connected fabric you're going to increase storage and increase the processing of the data. Uh, so the edge opportunity is, is very interesting to us. We, we think a lot of it is driven by low latency workloads. So the concept of NVMe um, is, is very uh, appropriate for that. We think in general SSDs um, deployed in, in edge data centers defined as anywhere from a meter to a few kilometers from the source of the data. Uh, we think that's going to be a, a, a very strong paradigm um, the workloads you mentioned, especially IoT, just machine generated data in general now, I believe, um, has eclipsed uh, human generated data in terms of just the amount of data stored. And so we think that that curve is just going to keep uh, going in terms of machine generated data. Much of that data is so well suited for zone storage because it's sequential, it's sequentially written, it's captured, it's and it, and it has a very consistent and uh, homogeneous life cycle associated with it. So we think what's going on with, with with zone storage in general, and and ZNS and SMR specifically are are well suited for where a lot of the data growth is is happening, and and certainly we're going to see a lot of that at the edge. 
Well, Phil, it's always great to talk to somebody who's been in the same industry for 30 years and is excited about today and the future <laughs> and, and, and as excited as they have been throughout their whole career. So that really bodes well for you, bodes well for, for Western Digital. And uh, we'll just keep hoping the smart people that you guys have over there, keep working on the software and the physics um, and, the, and the mechanical engineering to keep moving this stuff along. It's really, uh, it's just amazing and just relentless. Yeah, it is. It is relentless. What's what's exciting to me in particular, Jeff, is we've 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 driven storage advancements, you know, largely through, as I said, a you know a number of engineering disciplines, and and those are still going to be important going forward. The chemistry, the physics, the electrical, the the hardware capabilities. But I think as as you know as as widely recognized in the industry, the it's a diminishing curve. I mean, the amount of energy, the amount of engineering effort, investment the cost and complexity of these products to get to that next capacity step um, is, is getting more difficult, not less. And so things like zone storage, where we now bring intelligent data placement to this paradigm is what I think makes this current juncture that we're at very exciting. Right, right. Well, it's, it's, it's applied AI, right? Ultimately, you're going to have, you know, more and more compute, you know, compute power, you know, driving the storage process and 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 how that stuff is managed. And you know, as as more cycles become available and they're cheaper, and, and ultimately compute um, gets cheaper and cheaper. You know, as as you said, you guys just keep finding new ways to uh, to move the curve. And <laughs> we didn't even get into yeah. the totally new material science, which is also you know, come down the pike at some point in time. Well, Phil, yeah, very exciting times. It's, uh, it's been great to catch up with you. I, I really enjoy the Western Digital story. I've been fortunate to to sit in on a couple chapters. So again, congrats to you and uh, we'll continue to watch and look forward to our next update. Hopefully it won't be another four years. Okay, thanks Jeff. I really appreciate the time. All right, thanks a lot. All right, he's okay. Phil, I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.